Hi, everybody. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Really thrilled to be back with all of you who are following along in the DevX community and beyond. Uh, I am here in a series of conversations I've been doing throughout the pandemic, uh, virtually with leaders, thought leaders, experts around the world. And I'm really pleased to be joined by Ty McCormick, who is somebody I've known a, a bit over the years. You're a senior editor at the Foreign Affairs Magazine, part of the Council on Foreign Relations. You've had a career as a journalist uh, across the continent of Africa and beyond. And you've come out with a book, which is why I wanted to talk to you. And I appreciate you taking some time to do this today. Um, a fantastic book called Beyond the Sand and Sea. And it may not be what people are expecting if you're you know, in the DevX community. This is not a, this is not a book that's you know, uh, really focused on policy issues so much. Uh, this is not a book that's sort of data-driven. This is a, a book that's really a story um, about a young boy and his family and uh, their experience as refugees. But although it is a story, it is an anecdote, I think it really opens up our eyes, I hope, it certainly does, does mine, to some of the issues that we work on every day in the development and humanitarian communities. So I thought it'd be great to get you, Ty, to just tell us a bit about this incredible story and sort of what it means to you. So great to, to be with you today. Thanks, Raj. I really appreciate your having me on. Um, you know, I'm a big admirer of what you've done here at, at, at DevX and what you've built. Uh, so really an honor to, to get to be in conversation with you today. Um, the book is really the epic story of a family of Somali refugees and their 30 year journey, 30 year odyssey to reach the United States. Uh, this is a family that fled the civil war in 1991 uh, in Somalia, ended up in Kenya for much of the next three decades. Um, and that's really where we find them on the eve of Trump's travel ban. Uh, when the, much of the family is expecting to be finally uh, reunited in the United States. And then this ban comes down, this executive order uh, in January of 2017 and kind of slams the door one more time. So in a broader sense, this is the story of America's uh, refugee resettlement system, which uh, for a time was uh, the envy of the world. Uh, of course, not a perfect system, but one that uh, is pretty good uh, by, by all... Um, measures uh, uh, had a little hiccup in your internet there Ty but we, we got uh, just about all that and may, maybe yeah I see a few different themes here in in the book right one part is their experience as refugees leaving Somalia going to the Dabab refugee camp in Kenya, and they were fairly early in the growth of that camp. So your book kind of takes us through what it was like for this camp to grow and become this mega camp that it is today. And the experience as refugees in a camp, I think is one really important eye-opening um, narrative that you provide in the book, very useful to humanitarians who, who work in these areas. I think another one is that experience you just referred to of like getting out of the camp and the system of refugee resettlement into the United States or, or into other countries. And you have themes and you know, little anecdotes in the book about people making their way you know, to the north of Africa and trying to get across the Mediterranean, right? I mean, it connects to a lot of the broader refugee stories, not just this one family, but maybe we could just start at the camp experience. Like, you know, what, did, what was their life like at the camp? And what, if anything, did that tell you or open your eyes to about the way the camp system works, the refugee camp um, you know, system works around the world? Yeah, uh, Dadaab is this fascinating, complicated, uh, really tragic place in a lot of ways. It's, it's actually very hard to describe, I think, for people who haven't visited it themselves. Uh, in the book, I compare it to uh, the fictional town of Macondo from 100 Years of Solitude, uh, which, of course, uh, Garcia Marquez famously describes as cut off from the rest of civilization by forbidding mountain ranges and measureless swamps. Dadaab is also cut off from the rest of civilization. Uh, by this kind of vast semi-desert in Northeast Kenya um, and by an invisible web of restrictions that are designed to keep uh, the refugees in limbo. Um, it's a kind of place where life is circumscribed in a lot of ways. Um, underlying, I think a lot of our, all of our refugee policy really is this assumption that uh, the crises that give rise to displacement will that it's people will be able to go home, that wars will end, that normal life will resume. 
that has not happened uh, in places like Dadaab and places like Kakuma on the other side uh, of Kenya. Um, I wrote the book uh, in large part because of what I saw as kind of a profound transformation in the nature of refugee crises that's happened really during my lifetime. In the last three decades, sort of really coinciding with the end of the Cold War, uh, that temporal fiction, that assumption that these things will end fell apart. Uh, and people ended up in these camps for not just years, but generations. And so this story is really kind of an exploration of what does it mean to be a permanent exile? What does it mean to spend your whole life in a place where you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to own property, you're not allowed to leave the confines of the camp to mingle with the rest of the host community. Uh, you're really limited in so many ways. And so that's that's kind of the book was a, was a study of that condition. Yeah, to me, just, just reflecting on what are some of the reasons why we had that fiction in our minds, this idea that refugees will leave a crisis and then kind of want to go back home. You know, we know if you talk, talk to people who had to leave, they often do want to go back home. I mean, that is part of their goal, right? Their family, their culture, maybe back there. But what do you see as some of the underlying things that have shifted that have caused refugees to, to really more permanently settle in, in other parts of the world when they are forced to flee? I think it has to do with the shift in the nature of conflict that really happened at the end of the Cold War. You know, there, we saw an end really to interstate war. There's not many countries uh, that, that are fighting border wars, trench wars, things like that anymore. It's been largely an explosion of civil wars, uh, a lot of which are kind of low levels of violence. Body counts, uh, as many political scientists will remind us, are coming down. In a lot of ways, the world is becoming less violent, but it's displacing more people and for longer periods of time because of this kind of low level grinding violence that won't fully subside. Uh, political instability is, uh, is preventing people from returning home and this it's not getting resolved. The war in Somalia has been ongoing since 1990, well, since long before 1991, but since Siad Bari's regime really collapsed and opened the floodgates of that war uh, in 1991. The same is true in South Sudan on the other, side of Kenya's border, where you have an equally large or similarly sized refugee camp that is an outgrowth, outgrowth of a war that uh, has been ongoing since the 1990s. Um, and so I think that for all of those reasons, um, our system of accommodating refugees has become outdated in a lot of ways. Yep. Yeah, I would add a couple themes to what you say, which I completely agree with. I mean, one you talk about in the book a bit, which is that these may be internal conflicts, but they are globalized, right? So in Somalia, you have the United States sending in drones or at one point sending in Black Hawk uh, helicopters and troops. You have Ethiopia involved. Like these, these countries, these uh, internal conflicts become globalized in a way that may make them last longer than they otherwise would have um, and not, not get to a resolution. I think Syria may be another good example of that. And of course, a lot of people in, in this field talk about climate and the underlying causes that are pushing people to move around even within their own country uh, because of droughts and floods and, and you know, climate effects on, on a lot of people, especially depend on agriculture for a living. So I guess the bottom line is these are not trends that are short term. And as you say, if, th if this is the case, as many in the humanitarian community have you know, long realized, then we need a system that accommodates the reality of people leaving for long periods of time. And I guess I wonder what, do you have any takeaways from this experience of this family and all your incredible reporting on their journey about what that system could look like? Yeah, I wanna respond first to one thing you said about climate. Uh, I think this is a really important part of this story. Uh, a lot of these countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are going to be the hardest hit by climate change. Somalia is already arguably a war in which climate change uh, is, if not a driver, is certainly uh, a, a complicating factor and one that from time to time exacerbates uh, refugee outflows. You know, it's not an accident that the biggest waves of arrival in Kenya have happened after large droughts in Somalia, uh, oftentimes droughts that are compounded by uh, Al-Shabaab, which is the mil main militant group there uh, that the United States is engaged in this sort of shadow war with. Uh, they will do things like prevent humanitarian aid from reaching the areas that they control contributing to huge outflows of refugees into Kenya. So the climate piece, I, th I think, is extremely important in understanding these and ultimately is going to need to get woven into any framework, new framework, updated framework for how we think about refugees. Right now, there is not a legal basis on which to claim asylum because of climate change uh, 
you know, effects that you might be feeling as a refugee. It's really still the same factors that, uh, you know, were established after World War II. Um, so that's going to have to be part of the discussion. In terms of broader solutions, um, you know, I think that it's going to have to sort of be two things at once. One is there's going to have to be more leadership in refugee resettlement from developed countries, countries like the United States uh, and the 36 or 37 other refugee resettlement, designated refugee resettlement countries. When you say uh, more leadership, Ty, you basically mean taking larger numbers? I mean, is that essentially what you mean? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people may not realize that the United States um, has resettled three out of four of refugees that have been resettled anywhere in the world since 1980. They've taken in uh, about 3 million of 4 million. Um, you know, in any given year, the U.S. was resettling more than, uh, you know, Canada, the U.K., Australia, and these 36 to 37 other countries combined. That came to a pretty abrupt end uh, during the Trump presidency. And now, uh, you know, Canada is, um, you know, eating America's lunch on, on refugee resettlement. Um, and the Biden administration has, uh, after flip-flopping on this issue, has uh, actually raised the resettlement cap. Um, you know, the numbers I look at are not the cap. They're the actual resettlement numbers. And on that uh, score, we're off to a very slow start with the Biden administration. I think the last time I checked was the end of uh, the end of April, and it was less than 3,000 refugees that had been resettled so far in 2021. So way, way below the you know historical average here. There's another piece of this talk about leadership in some way. Behavior of all of the resettlement countries they do tend to follow um, what the United States is doing. And during the Trump presidency, you saw a huge drop off in resettlement around the world in European countries. Uh, the last year of the Trump presidency, all of Europe combined resettled fewer than 10,000 refugees. Um, that's a huge reduction in what historically they've taken in. And I think that it's hard not to read into that a, a permissiveness on the sense that the United States, this wasn't an issue that the Trump administration cared about. And so US allies said, well, we don't have to push on this either. So uh, I think there's big opportunity for the Biden administration here to come in and say, we care about this issue. We're gonna devote resources to this issue. We are going to rebuild the resettlement system, which uh, you know, has been the envy of the world. And we're gonna ask our allies and our friends to, to, to pick up some of the slack as well. And you know, right now, less than 1% of refugees around the world are resettled through the UN resettlement system every year. So we have a huge gap in demand versus the supply on this issue. Um, the other piece of this has to be how refugees are housed in the, the, the host countries that are housing the vast majority of refugees right now. Around the world, you know, it's overwhelmingly uh, stable, but relatively, you know, not, not terribly developed countries that are hosting refugees. Just countries like Uganda, Kenya, Pakistan, who are doing the heavy lifting here when in terms of housing refugees. They're not granting them asylum. They're not integrating them into their societies, but they are the ones physically housing the refugees. I think that at the same time that you ask the rich world to take more responsibility for resettlement, you have to simultaneously ask these host countries to do a better job of integrating these refugees into the host communities. If this is not a temporary um, fix, then we need to treat it like a permanent one and treating them like cities, allowing commerce to come above board. Right now, Dadaab, the camp that is the focus of my book, uh, is a giant sort of black market. It's a huge, you know, part of Um, you know, already people from the host community come to the camp to trade, to do all sorts of business, but it's not above board. Um, I think make, making an effort to, to legalize these places, to treat them more like cities than like camps uh, would go a long way toward um, improving the quality of the day-to-day -day lives of refugees who live in these places and allowing them, you know, really to live dign dignified lives. Yeah, I mean, so much of this gets to the politics of these issues, right? Because the, the very reason why um, places like the Bob are not integrated as much, not seen just as cities, people aren't given work permits and credentials is precisely because of the same kind of politics that fueled, you know, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee uh, feelings in the United States and in Europe. 
So getting around this is a challenging issue, especially if, as you're, you're arguing, we're going to see many more refugees, as many people think we will, with these underlying trends not, not diminishing. I guess the other side of the equation, you've got one tool, which is refugee resettlement. You're saying we need bigger numbers of that, and we need to support the refugees where they are in host communities. The other side is the development aid and humanitarian aid infrastructure that's meant to you know, make things stable enough that people don't need to flee. Did you learn anything about that from your reporting on this story that, that changed your view about that sector and how it works? You know, I'll say that it's not a, um, the case study that the book is built on is not one in which there's all that much to go on in terms of the development sector. Somalia is uh, in rough shape, a lot of it. And there's not a whole lot um, in terms of development aid that's reaching a lot of the country. Sure, there's a lot going on in Mogadishu. Increasingly, there's a little bit going on in Kismayo, a southern city that has sort of stabilized. But vast swaths of that country, you know, one of the things that's sort of most interesting about the country is that you meet people who have never received a government service of any kind, who have all, never even come into a contact with a government official, uh, which is one of the challenges that the government has in terms of convincing people that they're more legitimate than, say, Al-Shabaab, which does, in fact, create provide some social services. It does in its areas provide security. Um, one of the chapters of my book uh, follows Assad as he returns home to, for the first time to Somalia and he travels through Al-Shabaab controlled territory and gives this very rare window into a world in which certainly no Western journalists have been able to access. Um, and very few people have gone through it and then been able to speak publicly about it. Um, and the, the picture he paints is one uh, of you know, radical uh, extremism, but also of stability and predictability and order in a place that has had none of those things for the last 30 years. And so, you know, you ask truckers who drive wares from Kenya to uh, Mogadishu, which routes they prefer to take. Oftentimes they'll tell you that they prefer to take the ones controlled by Al-Shabaab versus the government because they're not asked for bribes. There's less corruption uh, ironically, in the uh, Al-Shabaab controlled areas than there are in the government controlled ones. So that speaks to the challenges that I think people working on the development end of this uh, have. And uh, in, in a way, it speaks to the opportunity that they have because uh, there's you know, so far to go in terms of building up the the international development and humanitarian presence is. Uh, sorry, it seems my internet is, is cutting out a little bit. Um, but okay, yeah. uh, when when refugees get returned to to Somalia, which is of course uh, in theory it would be a a, a noble goal of the humanitarian um, you know sector to to create the opportunity for people to go home. I think in this case there's a, a sort of pushing people to go home in order to, to fix this problem, perceived problem of, of refugees. But oftentimes uh, refugees will be returned to Somalia, mainly to two places in Mogadishu and Kismayo. Um, and they'll be given very limited, um, you know, a, a few, maybe a, a SIM card uh, with a few uh, electronic cash payments. They'll be given um, maybe a, a mat to sleep on, um, some other limited, very, you know, small, in the neighborhood of $500 worth of assistance per family or per person that goes back. And then they'll arrive at the airport and they'll leave. And that'll be kind of the last time that the humanitarian uh, sector uh, is in contact with them at all. And you ask people why that is. And certainly UNHCR doesn't is refuses to work outside of the airport in both of these places, or at least they did the last time I was doing work there. So I've traveled back with refugees who were being repatriated to Somalia and, you know, you, you go as far as the, the exit to the airport and that's it, you know, uh, UNHCR waves goodbye. And uh, I, I traveled back to where these refugees were actually going. And many of them had ended up living uh, in IDP camps back in their own countries that then just had none of the same uh, services that a place like the Dab is able to provide because it is relatively secure because it's institutionalized after 30 years of having the sector uh, and the aid and humanitarian sector working there. None of that exists in the home country, um, and that's just because people won't. They think it's too dangerous. They won't. They won't work there. Yeah, I guess that's the reason UN, UNHCR won't leave the airport, right? They think it's just too dangerous of a place. Um, and the UN does come in in your book for a little bit of criticism. I mean, at least there's a lot of the corruption you're talking about is not just with police officials and government officials. It goes to UN officials as well. Um, 
I, you know, they're the main kind of thrust of the story is how there's this doctor, right, who won't give the medical permission as part of the UN process, right, to get the family back to the United States. Um, I guess I wonder, have you spoken to people at the UN or based on your reporting over there, do you get the feeling that there's a, a sufficient understanding of how corruption is influencing this whole process? I think there's increasingly an understanding of it. I don't think there's too much interest in addressing it. Um, I think that certainly there's not an interest in, in speaking publicly about it, but you're right. The, the petty corruption, it tends to be pretty low level. We're not talking about officials, you know, in the secretariat building here in New York or in Geneva, you know, scheming to, to, to defraud refugees of this or that. Uh, this is kind of day-to-day -day ground level petty corruption, but it has um, a really devastating effect for the refugees that have to interface with those uh, you know, low level employees and that those employees have such incredible power over their lives, which of course opens, you know, the, the possibility for this kind of corruption. Um, the, the official you referenced is actually a, a senior nurse in the uh, IOM, International Organization of Migration System. Um, and, you know, we had this, this question that we wanted to answer that sort of looms over the whole book, which is that why was this family left behind in Dadaab uh, for 30 years when so many other families that had been promised resettlement in the US uh, were processed and came and began new lives. And they actually had one family member, a sister named Marion, uh, who is resettled. She has a separate resettlement case because she's married at the time and her, her um, case goes through. She begins a new life in Arizona um, and kind of sends back word to her family about what life is like in America. There's a source of hope. Uh, you know, she's a real sort of hero in this um, narrative. Um, nonetheless, the rest of the family is stranded and there's kind of nothing she can do about it. It's incredibly tragic. She's, you know, looking what's happening to the family's case. She's calling the resettlement agencies. She's, she's uh, out, you know, we travel back at the end of the book and try to unravel this question, which I didn't expect to be able to answer with any certainty. Um, and found that there was this kind of um, this, this small group of officials that were working together to use the leverage that they had uh, to, to exploit um, the refugees both sexually and, and for material gain, uh, you know, charging refugees bribes in order to essentially to do their jobs, which is to do the medical check and then clear those who are healthy enough. You know, this is a really rudimentary, or rudimentary medical check. It's not actually medical care. Uh, which was one of the reasons that we, we requested the records from UNHCR and they wouldn't give them to us because they said, well, it's not really medical records. No care was given uh, at this time. It's just a checkup. And, um, you know, they're trying to see, do you have tuberculosis? If you do have tuberculosis, we're going to give you a course of treatment and then get you on the plane. Uh, that didn't happen because they were, in this case, the senior nurse was, um, you know, was sort of propositioning a, a, a young member of the family that was attached to their case. And she said, no. Um, and he said, you know, you're not going anywhere. And we were able to, uh, you know, determine fairly conclusively that this had happened uh, because there were so many people who had had the same experience. Um, you know, we found more than a dozen women who said, you know, I went for my medical check and the same thing happened. And here I am waiting four, six, eight, ten 10 years later uh, to be resettled. Yeah, th those are maybe two more themes that are worth bringing up about why this problem gets exacerbated, right? One is income inequality, right? And, and when people are so poor, and that includes the police officers, and maybe includes some of these medical officials and others, they see a market here. Uh, it's an illicit market. It's an unethical market. It's wrong fundamentally, but it's in a way a market that people, refugees, want to leave and go somewhere else. And so there's a whole industry around the world, right? People getting paid to smuggle you know, refugees across borders and, and I guess people being paid illicit bribes to help, you know, grease the wheels around the, the refugee resettlement program. And then maybe the other theme is, you know, how the rights of women and girls get trampled in this scenario, right? You talk a lot in the book about child marriage, you know, Miriam, the, the sister you're referencing is a hero. She gets married really kind of against her will, sort of forced into it. She marries this guy that she has a pretty, has a pretty abusive relationship with, it sounds like. Um, you know, and it seems like women really lose out in this scenario. And as you say, they're coerced for sex or they're just, they're, they're really their opportunity to have freedom and independence is totally constrained, maybe in, in many ways in some of these societies anyway, but in the refugee experience, it's, much, it's made that much worse. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think I'm glad that you pulled that strain out. It's, it's an important one, I think, in the book, which is that um, these systems don't have the same effect on everyone. Um, and in fact, there are great inequalities in the camp. That's kind of apparent. Many people would think everyone is just poor in the camp. Everyone has is is at the mercy of uh, of these external powers. And that's true to a degree, but there are still real, uh, there's a real hierarchy uh, in the camp, both in terms of clan, uh, in terms of access to resources, in terms of gender, uh, in terms of all sorts of ways in which people sort, sort themselves and each other. Um, and one of the things I've tried to do in the book is I tell the, the story of Marion and Assad, two central protagonists, kind of in parallel. And their stories um, do mirror each other in a lot of ways, but then they also diverge quite dramatically in the end. Um, and uh, you know, one way to read Assad's narrative, which is, is not actually the way that I intended to be read in the book, but is a kind of narrative of triumph over uh, obstacles uh, and 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 um, you know over hardship. Um, my my point in telling it is more to to illustrate the obstacles themselves uh, and to suggest that they are largely insurmountable to most refugees. Uh, but Marion's narrative, I think, illustrates in the ways in which um, her story, um, she, she, there's no way in which she has the same story as Assad, because the same win, uh, windows of opportunity uh, that Assad had just weren't available to women, particularly at the time that she's a bit older than him. Uh, things were... to a lot of girls um, and helped families to see the value of educating girls. This is a kind of still a big obstacle, I think, uh, in the refugee communities where families expect, um, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily see the value of sending a girl to school. Um, and there's one scholarship in particular uh, that the Can Canadian government funds called the WUSC um, that is, you know, in, in my view, one of the most generous scholarships in the whole world that allows you to not just go to Canada to study, but uh, gives you the opportunity to um, sponsor your whole family to come with you. And so, as you might imagine, um, that has changed the culture around female education pretty dramatically in Dadaab because immediately there's this huge payoff potentially if your uh, daughter wins this scholarship and can bring you with her to, to a new future. So, and you uh, mentioned in the book somebody, a daughter who did that, and that helped to inspire Assad and others to say, hey, we got to study for this. We, we might have a chance to get out. Yes, that wasn't available for Marion at the time, and you know her her story, as you mentioned, is is a much harder road. She drops out of school in the sixth grade because of sexual harassment. Uh, she is, uh, I wouldn't say forced into a marriage, but sort of worn down by her family into uh, into a marriage that she didn't have a whole lot of hope for at the time. I think she had a sense that wasn't uh, you know faded uh, to end well, and then she spends much of the next ten years uh, in this kind of agonizing. Um, you know, back and forth with him, where which ultimately leads to divorce, which is its own set of, uh, I think, really difficult um, things for her and her family. Uh, but no, it's it's absolutely a story about gender roles in refugee um, settings and how uh, they they create a whole host of limitations for female and women refugees that uh, are just not in place for men. I know we only have a minute here here left, but I think it might be nice to just end on a note about what Assad is up to now. I mean, he is a remarkable person. We didn't really get into that in, uh, too much in our conversation today. One of the treats we'll leave for you who want to read the book. Um, an incredible person. W what is he up to right now? Which is a pretty extraordinary achievement. Um, he's just say that again, because well. I think you froze for a moment, Ty. Say it again. Uh, sorry, I said he's he's at Princeton finishing his junior year, just finished his junior year, which is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement. Um, you know, we didn't, as you said, we didn't get into it, but he uh, is this extraordinary, uh, driven, curious uh, young man who sort of wouldn't be limited by the opportunities around him. And uh, through this incredible journey that he went through, uh, ended up uh, studying literature at Princeton. So uh, he's heading into his senior year um, and I'm, I'm sure that we'll, be, we'll all be hearing from him uh, as he makes his way uh, in the world. Yeah, the, the book uh, certainly does highlight the obstacles and how things are so broken in the humanitarian and refugee systems, uh, but it does have this really hopeful component all the way through in this, in this protagonist of Assad who is 
you know, alone makes it worth reading the book. But I, I do have to recommend it highly to everybody who's watching along and to congratulate you, Ty, because it's really tough to do the level of reporting that you did on people going through this situation, right? Where there, there aren't as many documents, it's hard to get interviews, travel to places can be insecure. And I feel like you did the level of deep reporting that is often done on other topics. We come to expect on other topics, but we don't necessarily expect on an individual refugee family. And you went really deep in a way that illuminates, I think the story um, uh, in a way I haven't read before. So I, I really appreciate your your reporting on this, your book. Congratulations so much. And thanks for spending a few minutes uh, talking about it today. Thanks, Raj. That's really kind of you. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everybody.